yeah, let's, let's go ahead and get started. It's actually really um, neat that you had opened up with that particular chapter. That's going to be a repeated theme throughout this message, um, 1 John 4. Um, so that's going to be laying some, some groundwork. So tonight I want to preach about the cross. And again, where could you possibly go with that? There's like 50,000 different directions. I've preached on that several times. Um, I've even preached some of these ideas before, so if you've heard them, please bear with me. But I want to preach about the cross because it's absolutely central to the Christian faith. It's no surprise that when people think of Christianity and they attach Christianity to a symbol all throughout the world, for the most part, that symbol is the cross. And it's not, um, you know, it's not arbitrary. The scriptures themselves seem to all be pointing to the cross as this like climactic moment in the history of God's plan for salvation. Like all of history is going to the cross and from the cross. And so it's the center pretty much of everything. This is the same for the gospels. Like if you read the gospels, all of them are just like turning around this idea of the cross. In Luke 9.51, it says, as the time approached for him to be taken up to heaven, Jesus resolutely set out for Jerusalem. This idea that while he's moving around Palestine, while he's moving around and ministering, he has his eyes set on Jerusalem and he knows what's coming. He knows that the cross is his destination. Um, in fact, in the Gospel of John, it's the entire, you know, chapters 13 through 19, just these multiple chapters leading up to that climactic moment. If you go through the New Testament, Paul makes it abundantly clear that the cross is supposed to be central to our faith. In 1 Corinthians 2, 2, he says, For I resolved to know nothing while I was with you, except Jesus Christ and him crucified. I resolved to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. 1 Corinthians 1, 18, he says, For the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. So the idea of for us who are being saved, the cross is the power of God. Well, what does that actually mean? Are we viewing the cross as the power of God? And so I want to dive into some of these themes. Um, Galatians 2.20, Paul says, I'm crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. In the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith, by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Later on in that book in chapter 6.14, he says, But God forbid that I should glory, save in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ by whom the world is crucified unto me and I unto the world. So all that to be said, there's, this is only scratching the surface too. The um, New Testament documents are full of references to the cross. It's the central focus. And again, I just want to close that with the 1 Corinthians 2.2. 2. I resolve to know nothing except Jesus Christ and him crucified. So the question is, why is the cross important? Why is Paul putting so much significance on the cross? Why are the authors of the Gospels putting so much significance of the cross? Someone described the Gospel of Mark as just like a prelude to the crucifixion. Like all the narrative is so fast paced and it's like, go, 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 go. And the crucifixion is what, you know, the giant focal point is. And so why is it so important for our faith, for such a central aspect of our faith? What does the cross actually mean? That's the question I want to ask for us. And I'm sure at least some of you either how you were raised or where you are right now, the first thing that pops into your mind is atonement, and especially satisfaction, that somehow, you know, God has put on Christ, on the cross, the penalty of our sins, and he has received satisfaction for those sins, and we are therefore saved. That's going to be, you know, a knee-jerk response for a lot of people in thinking about the cross, and there's a lot of conversation there. Um, I hope to do a sermon on that at some point, but if it's just about this notion of satisfaction, if it's just about this notion of atonement, then we should be focusing most of our attention on the resurrection. Because Paul himself, in 1 Corinthians 15, 17, says, if Christ has not been raised, your faith is worthless. You are still in your sins. You see that? So if we're just focusing on the cross as the satisfaction for all of our sins, he's saying, without the resurrection, that's, that's nothing. And so it almost seems as if Paul should be saying, I resolve to know nothing among you except Christ raised. But he doesn't. He says, Christ crucified. I resolve to know nothing among you except the cross. It's not necessarily just about satisfaction because if he didn't raise, we were still in our sins. The cross could have happened, and if he had stayed in the grave, we would still be in our sins. And so I want to offer an understanding, and the more I've been thinking about this and rotating it in my mind, I used to preach some of these themes a bit differently. 
I'm seeing the cross more and more as just this beautiful, like, I don't know, the crown of all creation is just this gem that you can rotate around and see so many different facets. And I hope to preach um, continual sermons on these different facets, but I want to offer an understanding tonight about the importance and centrality of the cross um, that's not tied to satisfaction. So, a few weeks ago we talked about humanity having a vision problem that we can't see clearly, we can't see right. That's for sure when we're dead in our trespasses, but even when we're Christians, we're still you know, struggling to see clearly. Paul prays for the eyes of our hearts to be illumined, all of these things going on that we still need to purify our vision. We can't see reality correctly. We can't see clearly. Um, and I want to apply that to the cross because my proposition tonight is without the cross, we don't know God. We don't know what it means to be God or what it means to be human. So I'll say that again. Without the cross, we don't know what it means to be God, and we don't know what it means to be human. We talk about Jesus being fully God and fully human a lot, um, especially in like theology circles. It's one of these central tenets of the faith. He was God. He was human. But underneath that, a lot of times there's this assumption that we, just, we know what God is, and we know what humanity is, and Jesus happens to be both of those. But I want to turn this around and say, without the cross, we don't actually know either of those things. <laughs> We only know what it means to be fully God and fully man. We only know that Jesus is fully God and fully man through the cross. So I want to talk about the cross as something that reveals. It has a revelatory function for us. Um, the flow of the message, there's going to be three major you know, sections. The first is how we know God. How does the cross reveal God? The second, how do we know what it means to be human? How does the cross reveal humanity? And then the third, thank you, Brother Uriah, for reading one of my favorite chapters in the entire scriptures. How do we know love? How do we know what love is? So the first part, how do we know God, is going to be a bit abstract. I'm going to, you know, ask you guys to be following along. It can get a bit abstract, but I think it's worth it. The next, how do we know what it means to be human, to me, is personally really exciting. How do we know love, I think, is really practical, and so I'm hoping this sermon has a lot, and it, it was a really difficult you know, week for me in a lot of ways, but it's stuff like this. this um, these themes in the scriptures are the things that like, really give me life, and so I'm hoping that you know, at least a bit of what I've experienced, just even prepping for this, again, can be um, transmitted to you guys. So, let's start. What does it mean to be God? How do we know God? Um, Hebrews 1 tells us, I'm going to be jumping around the whole scriptures, by the way, so if you have a Bible, I'm sorry. Um, That's a common theme for my preaching, it seems. Hebrews 1 tells us that God has spoken various and diverse ways throughout the Old Testament, through the prophets, through the law, through all of these different things, and he's talking to Israel in all of these different ways. But despite that, in Job 36, 26, he writes, Behold, God is exalted, and we do not know him that we don't know God. There's some element of mystery in God. He's so beyond us. He's so transcendent. His thoughts are not our thoughts. His ways are not our ways. How could we possibly know this God who is so far away and who is so other? He's eternal. We're finite. He's He's uncreated. We're created. There's all of these gaps that how could we ever cross that? And you can see that theme being pictured in like, the place where God's presence is most um, concentrated in the entirety of the Old Testament is in the Holy of Holies, and what's right outside of the Holy of Holies? Anyone? The showbread and the altar of incense. Yes, and then between that and the Holy of Holies, there's a veil, right? So there's a veil. So God is dwelling with his people. His presence is right here most profoundly in all the world, and he set up a veil. It's like, what's going on there? There's a lot of themes of holiness, X, Y, and Z, but even that veil... Um, we see that we're still not getting the full picture. Like, even the high priest that goes in there, because in Isaiah 6, 1, Isaiah writes, In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting upon a throne, high and lifted up, and the train of his robe filled the temple. The train of his robe filled the temple. And so he's, he's having this vision, he's having this, you know, spiritual vision of God himself, and the only part 
that's filling the temple, which for all of Israel is like the fullness of God. It's just the very tip of his robe. The train of his robe is what's filling the temple. Um, the, New Testament, the New Testament makes this theme abundantly clear in the very beginning of John, when John just straight up writes in 118, he says, no one has ever seen God. No one has ever seen God. This idea that God is somewhat mysterious, somewhat far off, even in all the ways that he's revealing himself to us, there's still a distance between us and God. Um, in 1 Timothy 1.17, says, God is immortal, invisible, God only wise. Are we, we know that passage is a beautiful hymn. But this idea of invisible, you know, where, where can I look and see, oh, there's God, oh, there's God, that God is, but you know, by nature, invisible. So how do you show people something that's invisible? I'll present this actually as a, you know, a real question to you guys. Look at this. I have this amazing statue in my hands. Do you guys see it? What does it look like? No one, yeah. Um, <laughs> it's this invisible statue. It's the most beautiful statue you've ever seen, and it's so exciting to look at. How could I possibly show that to you? Well, there's actually a way. If I were to cover it up, if I were to drop a towel over it, it would take the form of it. You see? So the only way I can show you guys something that's invisible is by hiding it, is by covering it up, by veiling it. You guys see that illustration? If I have this invisible thing, I drop a towel over it and it takes the form of it. All of a sudden, you can start to see for the first time what this thing is, what this invisible thing is. And you can start to see the beauty of it. And so that's what's going on with the incarnation, at least in part. The Proverbs say it's the glory of God to conceal a matter. You know? I'm not saying this is like the exegesis of this passage, but Paul also says Christ is the glory of God. And so in the incarnation, we have God himself covered with humanity. And all of a sudden, we can see God for the first time. We can start to make out who God is. But we're still not at the cross yet. Um, I want to hit on that point, too. So Colossians 2.9 says, For in him, in Christ Jesus, the fullness of God, the invisible God, dwells in bodily form. So if we want to see the fullness of God, we look at Christ, who's dwelling in bodily form. And he is the image of the invisible God, is what Paul writes in Colossians. He's the image of the invisible God. So again, if I want to show you this beautiful statue in my hands, I cover it up, and all of a sudden you can start to see the image of that invisible statue. So how does this relate to the cross? Well, um, oh, these are double-sided. Yikes. Um, Sorry, I'm not used to double-sided pages. Okay, cool. Um, <laughs> okay, and then one more, one more note on that. Um, if this all sounds, you know, like speculative, Hebrews literally says this, a new and living way has been opened for us through the veil that is his body. So it's explicitly saying the body of Christ is the veil. It's something that has simultaneously covered, and it's something that reveals but, again, we're still not the cross. And so, for the most part in the scriptures, Jesus isn't recognized for who he is. That's one of the problems. People don't know. Is he just a prophet? Is he just a holy man? Is he a false teacher? Is he the Messiah? But if he is the Messiah, is he going to, you know, conquer Rome with the sword? And all, all of these questions come about who is Jesus, and people don't really know who he is. There's a lot of back and forth. There's this voice from heaven saying he's the son of God, and people are debating, like, oh, was that just thunder? Is this, you know, God himself? And so people aren't sure when they're looking at Christ who he really is. And even those who recognize him, so Peter saying, you are the Christ, the son of God, they have this knee-jerk reaction against the cross. So soon after Peter confesses him, he rejects the cross. Jesus says, hey, I'm going to go, and I'm going to be delivered, and I'm going to I'm going to die. I'm going to suffer the fate of the cross. And Peter says, by no means, Savior, let this not happen to you. And what's Jesus' response? Get behind me, Satan. It's a, his most emphatic rebuke, it seems, potentially in the entirety of the New Testament to his most close disciple, who's the first to recognize him. And so he knows he's the Christ, but without the cross, there's still something missing. 
We see this again in the foot washing, you know, in part that Peter's saying, like, no, 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 don't wash my feet. And Jesus is saying, if I don't wash your feet, you have no part in me. Um, so this veil that God has put over himself, this veil of humanity that God has put over his son, it gives us knowledge, but it also conceals. To see God, we need that veil to be broken. We need that veil to be lifted, that veil to be torn. And when does that happen? In the New Testament. The crucifixion. Who said that? Nice. Um, At the crucifixion. So Matthew 27, verses 50 to 51. When Jesus cried out again in a loud voice, he gave up his spirit. And in that moment, in that moment of death, the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. So in that moment, the curtain was torn. And all of a sudden, um, we have the ability for the first time to enter into the holy place, into the holy of holies, and know God, who he is for the first time. In Hebrews it says, therefore, brothers and sisters, since we have confidence to enter the most holy place by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way opened for us through the veil that is his body. And so, God has put over a veil, and then in the crucifixion, that veil is ripped asunder, and we have access to God. So, at the moment of his crucifixion, the veil concealing the fullness of the invisible God was torn, and at the moment of utter weakness, God's power was made perfect. And the centurion says prophetically, truly, this man is the Son of God. There's a ton of passages I could keep going on. I don't want to belabor the point, but Paul writes, Therefore, from now on we recognize no one by the flesh, even though we have known Christ by the flesh, yet now we know him in this way no longer. That since the cross, we know God, we know Christ in a different way. Since since the cross, we have a new revelation of who God is. We know this because for the first time, the fullness of God has been displayed for all humanity on the cross. Notably, um, in 1 John um, 4, 8, I think it is, John writes, God is love. And then later in the scriptures, it says, no greater love than this that a man would lay his life down. So if we want to know what love is, we'll get to that later. But we see that in the cross. So, again, this is the abstract part, so thank you for bearing with me so far. Um, If we want to enter through the veil, which is his body, um, which was broken and opened up for us, how do we do that? How do we do that here and now? Again, all this seems very abstract, but these are like the central symbols of our faith, and I want to offer them for you know, our meditation and reflection. If we want to enter through the veil, how do we do that? Where do we have access to his body, which is broken for us? His body, which is the veil, who's been broken for us to reveal the fullness of God. Where do we have access to Christ's body broken for us? At the Eucharist at the Eucharist. And so all of these themes are like coalescing that our access to God is intrinsically um, tied to the Eucharist. That's Christ's body being broken for us. That's where we have our experience and encounter with God. That's our holy of holies. That is our encounter with God himself. Um, And that's where we become, as Peter says, partakers of the divine nature itself is through the Eucharist. And so I want to lift up our view of the Eucharist. I hope you already have a pretty high view of the Eucharist, but I want to lift it up even higher to say that this is where we experience God. This is where we experience the fullness of God. This is why Paul says in the Eucharist, we are proclaiming the death of the Lord, not the resurrection. You know, that is incredibly important, but we're proclaiming the death of the Lord because in his death at the cross, in the breaking of his body, in the breaking of the bread, the veil has been lifted and we have access to the fullness of God. And so in that way, the cross reveals to us who God is for the first time. Um, So to wrap up those themes real quick, and then we'll move on to humanity. Christ's body is the veil. Christ's body is broken on the cross, and he shows himself there to be God. We can enter into the Holy of Holies, into Christ's very own presence through Christ's broken body, through the Eucharist, which is a proclamation of Christ's death. So all of these themes are surrounding the cross, 
And I'm positing at least in part, and again, there's a lot more to this, but at least in part, that's why Paul is so insistent on the cross. It's not just an addendum to our faith. It's not just like, oh, there's this divine transaction that took place and we should be really thankful for that. No, it's at the very core of how do we know God himself. If I'm doing all of these you know, Christian commandments, if I'm doing all of these other things, that's great. But if I don't understand Christ on the cross, I'm like Peter saying, Christ, you're the Messiah, but far be it from you that you should be crucified, to which Jesus says, get behind me, Satan. You don't know what this is about. So if we don't have an understanding of the cross, we don't have an understanding of God, because that's where he's revealed. So that's the revelation of God. Now I want to talk about what it means to be human. So we say the cross reveals God. I want to say the cross also reveals humanity. What do I mean by that? And thank you guys for bearing with me. This stuff has made me feel really alive after a difficult week, so I'm hoping it's helpful. So... I hope that we're all quick to say that Jesus is fully human. Jesus doesn't just appear to be human. He's not just a mirage. He's not just like some other creature that came down. No, Jesus is fully human. But what does that mean? Does that mean that I take my conception of myself? Like, hey, I know you guys are all humans. I just take all the things I know about you and apply it to Jesus? Well, not quite. Because again, what if our conception of humanity is off? What if I don't actually know what it means to be human? Because Jesus does a lot of things that I don't. So who's missing in this statement of fully human? If Jesus is doing a lot of things that I don't, and he's fully human, one of us us is missing there. Um, So he does things that I don't. He has perfect submission to the Father. That's one example. He says, I can do of myself nothing. I don't seek my own will, but the will of the Father who sent me. As much as I want that to be true for me, I can't say that that's true of me every second, every moment of every day. But it is true for Jesus. And so which of us is missing what it means to be human? It's not me. I mean, no, it's not Jesus. It is me. Thank you. Um, (laughs) Blip, cut, edit, no. Um, It's not Jesus. Um, By the way, we see this with regards to the cross when he says, not my will, but your will be done. This perfect submission to God, this perfect submission to the Father, which I don't have, but which he has, and he's showing me what it means to be human. Um, He has perfect love. Greater love hath no man than this, that he lay down his life for his friends. So, if Jesus is fully human and does these things, and if I don't do these things, it's, you know, I would propose it's because I'm not yet fully human. I would say that none of us are yet fully human. We're not fully what God created us to be yet. Um, In the sense, we're still being created. That every single day we're being fashioned, we're being formed, and God is still working in us to work and to will for his good pleasure. We see the themes of this being presented in, um, I think, Philippians, that God who has began a good work in you will bring it to completion, that we're not complete yet. And of course, we're made according to the image of God, but what if that work is not yet complete? Because what is the image of God? And again, very controversial. I'm going to make the proposition because it's laid out in scripture in Colossians 1.15 that He is the image of God. He is the image of the invisible God. And so who of us is fully conformed to Christ? And to the degree that we're not conformed to Christ, we're still not fully human because he's the fully human one. I'm belaboring the point because it's this really interesting switch in how at least I used to think of things. And as soon as you make that switch, it seems like this whole world of possibilities opens up. Um, And this is made especially clear in Romans 5, 14, when Paul says that Adam was just a type or a symbol or a shadow of the one to come. That even Adam himself, he wasn't the fullness. He wasn't the end goal. He wasn't the end game. He was a type. He was a shadow. He was showing us this is what kind of it's going to look like, but the real one, the second Adam, will come. Um, So if you want to go down the rabbit hole, which I like to go down the rabbit hole, You can see this in the Genesis narrative when God is creating everything. What does he say at the beginning? He says, let there be light. It's like divine fiat. Let there be, let there be, let there be, let there be birds, let there be ocean, let there, it's all these divine fiats and they almost like just, I mean they do, they just appear into existence. And then God changes up the pattern when it comes to humanity. He doesn't say let there be humanity and poof, there's a fully formed human being. He says, let us make. He didn't say let us make light, let us make the earth. 
It's almost as if he's setting up this stage, you know, all of these let there be's for his one creative work that he wants to get across. Let us make humanity. Let us make a human being. Um, and we see this theme throughout scripture. I think it's one of the most beautiful themes, um, especially through the Old Testament. Um, Isaiah 45.9 says, Woe to the one who quarrels with his maker, an earthenware vessel among the vessels of the earth. Will the clay say to the potter, what are you doing? Or the thing you are making say, he has no hands? So this picture of Israel still being formed and still being molded. All of these people are still being fashioned by God, and he's decrying the hubris of Israel when they're saying, God, what are you doing? You have no clue what you're doing. It's like a clay pot on the spinny thing. What do you call it? What? Wheel? Thank you, a wheel is a spinny thing. Thank you. Um, It's like the clay pot on the wheel looking up at the craftsman and saying, you have no clue what you're doing. And it's just this absurd, almost comical, you know, depiction of pride to say the craftsman doesn't know what he's doing. For our purposes, though, it shows that we're still on that wheel. We're still being made. We're still being crafted. Um, And it gives a new expression. I love this, to the expression stiff-necked. Like, um, God talks about Israel being stiff-necked a lot through the Old Testament. And it's really... You know, you could go a lot of ways that, like, you can say you can't see God working over here because you're staring over here. But another part of it is how, how can you craft a pot with a bunch of stiff clay? Like, you can't. As soon as you try and mold the clay, it just shatters and breaks. And so if we're actively being fashioned by God right now and we become stiff rather than flexible and submissive, we break. And that's what happens with Israel. Okay. So... How does this all relate to the cross? I'm going to present that the, the, especially the John narrative, when we see the cross in John, it's a fulfillment of this picture of Genesis where we have a, a yet incomplete humanity. Um, what are the first words of the Gospel of John? Anyone know? In the beginning. What are the first words of Genesis? In the beginning. And so John is playing off this picture of Genesis. In the beginning. So we have creation. We almost have as if John is talking about, well, this is new creation. We have the same thing going on. And for the first several chapters of John, it's saying, and on the first day, these things happen with Jesus. On the second day, these things happen with Jesus. On the third day. And playing right into these types of Genesis, saying on day one, on day two, on day three. And so we're seeing John lay out something where it seems that God is going to do something with his creative work somehow in this life and ministry of Jesus that wasn't complete in Genesis. And it's very interesting because the actual cross event is very, you know, rich with all these themes. Um, Christ is led to the cross. He's betrayed. He's handed over. And Pilate says, and he's looking at Christ going through this whole experience, he says, behold the man. Not just behold the human male, you know, for all you Greek people, it's not behold ho um, oner, like it's not, you know, just a male person. He says, behold ho anthropos, behold the human being. And so we see this, behold the human being. Um, where is it? Oh, behold the human being. And in this sense, the fulfillment of the type of Adam. And what does Jesus say upon his death? He says, it is finished. If we're following through this theme, you know, there's a lot of things that all these things mean, but if we say it is finished, at least one of these things that is finished, I would suggest, is the creation of humanity. What began in Genesis, let us make, is now completed. It is finished. Behold the man. Behold the human being. Um, it goes on from there, like, there's just so many themes from Genesis. You know, the, the thorns that came up because of sin in Genesis, like now creation bears thorns. Well, Jesus has taken those thorns and put them on his head as his crown of glory. When Adam fell asleep, what was born out of his side? Eve, his spouse, his wife. When Christ falls asleep on the tree, when Christ dies on the cross, what comes out of his side? The church. If you want to, you know... Fill that in. It's the, the sacraments which make up our church, the water and the blood, baptism and the Eucharist. And so just like Adam 
Just like Adam is given a spouse as he falls asleep, so too Christ is given his spouse when he falls asleep. Just as in Genesis, there's a serpent on a tree promising life but giving death. In John, we see the serpent lifted up, going all the way back to Moses, promising death but giving life. And so, in this picture, we see that at the cross, that's what it means to be human. That's what God is going for. And what's happening at the cross? It's somebody choosing to be perfectly submitted to the Father, to pour out his life for the life of others, to love unto death. And the idea is that you can't just make that by divine fiat. You can't just, you know, create this if you want to have any sort of free will at all. And so this is this process that God is leading us through. Um, it also makes sense of some of the vague theological language that we see in like Colossians 1.16. It says, the Son is the image of the invisible God, firstborn over all creation. All things have been created through him and for him. Like, what does that actually mean? What does it mean to be created through Christ? What does it mean for humanity to be created through Christ and for Christ? Well, right here, we see it. If Christ is the fully human one, then we are created through Christ by entering into his death and entering into his life. And in the same way, we're created for Christ because we are his spouse, we are his church. So there's all these themes um, moving around, which is, to me, very exciting. So, again, this idea that when we say God is, or Jesus is fully God and fully man or fully human, I want to drive home the point that it's not just that he's what we think of God or he's what we think of humanity and it's like, oh, I know what God is, I know what humanity is, Jesus happens to be both. No, it's we actually don't know God. We actually don't know humanity until we see it on the cross, until the veil is lifted, until we see, behold, the man, the human being, the finished one. That's where Jesus can say in the church to Laodicea in Revelation, he says, behold, um, I'm the beginning of God's creation. I'm the beginning of God's creation, and we see this. He is the beginning of our new creation. This is what it means to be human. And until we're there, we've yet to arrive. Um, so, I know that's a lot of stuff. Again, this is the stuff that makes me feel very at rest, almost, and so this is why I'm talking about it this week. Finally, to bring it more down to something more practical and something that you can like really chew on, what does it mean to love? Everyone knows, you know, what love is, but can you like pin it down like, oh, there, I see love happening right there. Like it's just this abstract. But until something abstract can become something that you can see and look at, it's really hard to do anything with it. It's like, okay, I think that's kind of love or that's love or maybe this is love. But in 1 John 3.16, John writes, by this we know love, that he laid down his life for us and we ought to lay down our lives for the brothers. And so if God is love, and again, we don't know what God is, we don't know what love is, until we see the cross. By this, for the first time, we know love, that he laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for our brothers. And so John is giving us this event as a pattern for us, like if we want to love our spouse, if we want to love our children, if we want to love the brothers and sisters in our church, if we want to love the world around us, we have a pattern. And it's the cross. This is how Christians practically love one another, by laying their lives down for the benefit of others. Paul puts it a different way. Count yourself not significant and look not to your own interests, but lay those down and look for the interests of others. And so this is how we practically love one another. It's this example of the cross. So there's two aspects of this. We talked about this a long time ago when I said, like, what is the cross? What does it mean to bear one's cross? Um, the first is simply dying for others, laying down our lives. Um, when we're called to bear our crosses, this seems to be what he has in mind. But again, we talked about it this, in the sermon a while ago. It's not just dying. It's not just dying itself. It's dying via love of others. It's doing something sacrificial, not just for the sake of sacrificing, but sacrificing for someone else, sacrificing for our love for others. Um, because Paul writes, if we give our bodies to be burned, but have not love, we profit nothing. And then the other idea is this bearing of others' sins. 
We've talked about this a lot, and especially in our peacemaking over the past year and the peacemaking seminars and all of our um, discussion about what happens when there's sin, what happens when brokenness enters into the church, what happens when we're broken or our friend is broken or our brothers are broken. And again, we're given an example. In 1 Peter 2, 24 through 25, he says, he himself, Christ, bore our sins in his body on the tree that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. By his wounds, you've been healed. Again, this isn't just a one-time thing like, yay, Jesus did it and now we're all off the hook. No, this is our pattern. That we can bear the sins of other people in our body. The things that might not seem just, the things that might not seem right, but we actually take those sins on us. And again, to the world, this looks like foolishness. We've already talked about that. The cross is foolishness to the world, but for us, it's the power of God. And so in our interpersonal conflicts and in our interpersonal relationships, we have a mechanism to love others and to bear each other's sins because we're all going to sin. We're all going to fall short. And when we take on other sins and bear the consequences of them in ourselves, we're following after Christ. Notably, 1 Peter 4.8 says that love covers a multitude of sins. Love covers a multitude of sins. There's also an aspect of the cross, we're not going to talk about it here, but I want to, you know, at least mention it because there is an aspect of the cross where sin is condemned. In Romans, it says God condemned sin in the flesh of Christ. And so at some point, sin does have to be brought into judgment. That's for another sermon later. I want to throw that out just to say it's not just like accept everything and then like hope. Yeah, we'll get to that later. But it is the pattern that we do bear each other's sins. We don't go out seeking, you know, obviously retribution. We don't go out even seeking necessarily justice because that's in the hand of God. All that we do is patiently bear and follow the path that Christ has set for us. Um, so all that being said, I know that was a lot to throw at you. This is more like the summation of my, you know, meditations this week. I think one of the reasons, and again, it's like this prism, you turn it over and over and over, that the cross is so important for us as Christians and that we shouldn't just, you know, be like, oh yeah, the cross, that's, you know, where something happened. Because our beliefs, even if we don't know we have our beliefs, are going to influence the way we live. Um, I just did some work this week where the example was given of a woman who was in, domestic, in a domestic abuse situation and she's really thinking about the cross in certain situations and like a certain framework of like this heavily, you know, penal substitutionary model and like this is, this is influencing how she's relating to her husband and all this stuff and all that to say, what we believe, even if we don't know what we believe, influences how we act and so it's really important. If, Christ, if Paul has resolved to know nothing except Christ crucified, to proclaim the cross, then we have to have a good understanding of what the cross actually is. And at least part of it, and I would say an important part of it for us, is that it shows us who God is. Without the cross, we don't even know who God is. That, you know, maybe God's this far off just judge who's throwing lightning bolts from the sky. Well, we see in the cross that that's not a full picture. That's not the complete picture of who God is. It might not even be a right picture. We look at humanity and say, well, I'm good to go. Like, I'm obviously a human being. God has done this great work in me, and I've been baptized. That's great. But do we have the humility to say that we're not yet like Christ, that we haven't yet arrived? And if we don't have that humility, we're going to become, like, we're going to become stiff-necked. We're going to be that pot on the wheel that's spinning and is so stiff and thinks that it's already done that when God tries to touch it, it just breaks. Because if I'm already perfect, why do I need to change? So, all that to say, um, I want, yeah, I want to, pick, to present the cross as something that shows us who God is, that shows us what humanity is, and shows us what it means to love others. And there's a lot of stuff from this, like, it should give us a huge huge um, notion of the Eucharist. It should give us the picture of the Eucharist as the veil being torn, as Christ's body broken for us, and this is how we have access to God. We enter through the veil and partake of God himself. Um, it shows us how to love one another practically. Like when we're going through our day-to-day -day actions, when we're thinking of how we can interact with those around us, Paul says to look not for your own interests, 
but for the interests of others. That's a very shorthand way of saying, you know, live out the cross. Lay your life down so that others may live. And then finally, um, this should give us a lot of impetus to renew our study, our fellowship, our abiding with Christ himself as a person. Because this isn't just some abstract like concept floating around. He's a real person. He is a person who is alive right now, interceding for us at the right hand of God. He's a person in whom the scriptures we have all of this testimony about. We see him working through his spirit in the world today. And so all of this to say, as we behold Christ in the scriptures, in his work today at the Eucharist, as we behold Christ, Paul tells us that we're transformed degree by degree into his glory. And again, that comes with this humility that we're not there yet. We still have a long way to go. So, I just want to close with a passage from 2 Corinthians, just two verses. So, 2 Corinthians 5, verses 14 through 15. For Christ's love compels us. I just want to stop there. What compels us? What is supposed to be the gas in our engine when we're doing church planting work, when we're parenting, when we're being ministerial? What's supposed to be the gas that we put into our engine that compels us to go forward? Paul is saying Christ's love compels us. Because... We are convinced that one died for all, and therefore all died. And he died for all, that those who live should no longer live for themselves, but for him who died for them and was raised again. So that's the final you know, imparting message I want to give to us all. That we are convinced that one died for all, therefore all died, and he died for all, that those who live, you know, hopefully all of us are alive right now, um, how do we live? No longer for ourselves, but for him who died for them and was raised again. There's this beautiful prayer. I think it was Ignatius of Loyola who came up with it. Um, And it's this meditative prayer that you repeat over and over every single day and you process this and you say, what have I done for Christ? What have I done for Christ? What are, in other words, what are the things that I've done specifically because Christ is who he says he is? He came down and did all of these things. What are the things that I've done that I wouldn't have done if it weren't for Christ. So past tense. What am I doing for Christ currently? What am I doing that I otherwise wouldn't be doing if Christ wasn't who he said he was? And then what ought I do for Christ? So what have I done for Christ? What am I doing for Christ? What ought I do for Christ? And in pondering this and in praying this and thinking about this and meditating, We can get to the place, Lord willing, that we no longer live for ourselves, but truly do live for Christ, for him who died for us and was raised again. So all of this to say, the cross is literally the center point of our faith, and I want to suggest at least tonight that part of the reason is because this is how we know. This is how we know God. This is how we know humanity. This is how we know love. All of these themes boil down and coalesce in the cross of Christ. And so with that in mind, let us... Remember the cross, let us partake of the Eucharist um, as we do week by week, and let us live no longer for ourselves, but for Christ. Amen. That's what I have to share today.